Alice Brooks is cinematographer for both Tick, Tick, Boom and In the Heights. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Uh, Alice, it's such a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I wanted to ask you first and foremost, how both films, even though they're so different, um, they're set in different neighborhoods at different periods of time, they're both uniquely and inherently New York stories. So I wanted to know, how did you approach your work as cinematographer in really making New York a character in both films? Uh, so each film is, is very specific New York and they're two very different neighborhoods, two very different time periods. And um, on In the Heights, uh, my, I, the way I approached that was I realized my job was to fall in love with Washington Heights. And so I just completely immersed myself there and spent as much time there as possible. And on Tick, Tick, Boom, it was really different. Tick, Tick, Boom is a very personal story to me. Um, when I read the script, I thought these could be scenes from my childhood. I grew up in New York in the 80s. Um, we left two months before this movie began when I was 10 years old, we moved to Los Angeles. And um, so this period in New York will forever be my New York. It is the New York, uh, it, it's the memory of New York that's etched in, in a 10 year old where vision and light and color and, and emotions are all heightened. And so um, when Lynn and I started talking about, about, about the movie, I showed him, pictures from my childhood. I, I grew up in a tenement building just like Jonathan with a bathtub in the, in the kitchen. My father was a playwright and my mother was a dancer and my dad was trying to make it in theater in New York just like Jonathan. And so uh, and so and when I showed these to Lynn, he's like, he's like, that moment in time is exactly what I want New York to look like because we're the same age and he wanted New York to look like he remembered it when he was 10. So we were both totally on the same page with that. And, and Jonathan's this really childlike figure. He doesn't want to grow up. And so, so that's where we that's where we created from. Yeah, I'm so glad you you brought up your personal experience and the way it ties into the film. Um, and something about the film that's so striking, and we'll start with Tick Tick Boom and then uh, get to In the Heights later, but um, it is such a, the film and the musical are so much about, you know, interiority and Jonathan's personal journey um, as composer, but the film has such a beautiful kind of variety and uh, vibrancy in, in how you and Lynn shot the space and move us, you know, from apartment to diner to rehearsal space to workshop space, um, performance space. So could you just talk about opening up that kind of interiority of the, of the story to really embrace, you know, the wider canvas of of the cinema. So I I because I grew up a child actor, and so when I'm approaching a project, I very much approach it the same way as I would an actor. I asked a director for intention. So well, we were I we go scene by scene, and I would ask Lynn, "What is the emotional intention of each scene?" And that. And, and so when we're inside, it does, it feels very claustrophobic. It feels, I mean, this is a very dark and sad week for, for Jonathan. He, he, it's the moment where he gets to make his decision whether he, or not he sticks to his dreams no matter what. And I think so many people have been there, so it's so relatable. And, and so feeling that tightness and, and, then, and then when we go, do get to go out and be in the world, Sometimes he feels very small, um, like when he's in, in Times Square, we've got him very small walking along. Um, and, and, and we pull back in Sunday to this huge shot where, again, he's small. He has, he has all these ideas and, he, and huge ideas, and he's trying to make his mark on the world. And the world is so big. And how do you, how do you then... Um, how, how do you make a mark? And, and that's, that is the question that's posed is what do we do with the time we have? And so, um, so that, that was part of how we processed going from those tight interiors to those big exteriors. Yeah, I think Sunday is a perfect example of that. And you just, you just brought it up because it starts in that very narrow diner space and then literally opens up you know, the wall of the diner into the city street. Um, I wanted to ask you, and now hearing your background um, in kind of theater and as an actor and your, your family history, 
um, how much you already knew Sunday in the Park with George and maybe rewatched the PBS recording of the Sondheim musical as you and Lynn were, you know, kind of choreographing that beautiful tribute in, in Sunday. Uh, so I, um, because my mom was a dancer and a singer and we lived in New York. I mean, my first Broadway show was Into the Woods, the original Broadway cast when I was eight. Um, my mom always was singing Sondheim my entire life. I mean, I know a little night music back and forth. I know Sunday in the Park with George and I can sing it in my sleep. Um, so, so then, so then during prep, yeah, we watched, I mean, we watched that PBS recording, which we owned or we had, you know, recorded from on VHS when I was growing up and could play it whenever we wanted, but we watched it over and over and over again. One day with the actors, we watched it and, um, and that almost became the scene where they're watching it in the movie too. So um, yes, Sunday in the Park with George has, has always been part of my DNA. Yeah, one other scene I wanted to ask you about, um, which kind of also in a strange way, you know, kind of parallels in the Heights, they both have these really different but really pivotal pool scenes. Um, the song Swimming in Tick, Tick, Boom um, with uh, Andrew Garfield's character, Jonathan Larson, trying to figure out what that pivotal song is gonna be uh, in Superbia the day before, the night before the workshop. Um, it's such a beautiful scene and you have to kind of capture with the camera, the kind of propulsion of the music and then it all kind of changes on a dime to this beautiful kind of introspective um, and kind of magical um, moment where the, the lanes and the kind of uh, distance markers become the staff, the musical staff. Um, can you talk about working with Lynn and Andrew on that moment, which is such is one of the, you know, more resonant and kind of emotionally climactic scenes of the film? Uh, so I love swimming because that moment is it's a visual representation of a of a single moment of genius for Jonathan. And um, in some ways, I feel like it was also this moment of genius for Lynn. He, um, we fell in love with the swimming pool. We looked at locations, but we fell in love with the swimming pool because it looked like music staff paper, the lines at the bottom of the pool. And then, and then we started to explore it more. We went there a lot and I would dunk my camera under the water to start to explore what uh, my phone under the water, I should say, that's waterproof. And I would start to explore like what, what, how we should move underwater. I, it was pre-COVID, so there were swimmers in the pool and I would sort of study the swimmers. And then I started looking at all these different tiles at the bottom that are beautiful aged patina tiles. And they had red and green stripes and like the lyrics said, and, and the numbers were so specific to what was in swimming and we were re-watching this footage I shot and during while we were storyboarding and Lynn said what if Jonathan touches the 30 the number he is so scared of turning and it turns into a treble clef and that's how the that's how the notes appeared I mean it is it, it I watched Lynn have this epiphany and it was beautiful and and then Andrew is a swimmer his dad was a swim coach and so he was totally game to do the sheer number of shots we wanted for this number because it, we, it did it wanted that claustrophobic feeling that high anxiety feeling where we're cutting 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 and then he sinks to the bottom of the pool and everything slows down and but you earn that slowing down by the rhythm of the beginning of the song. And so, uh, so it was this amazing discovery and collaboration and, and figuring it out all together is beautiful. Yeah, and you've talked about, you know, all along uh, working with Lynn, but, you know, it is just so striking that this is his film directorial debut because it feels like such a kind of um, established and confident um, piece of filmmaking. So can you just say a bit more about working with Lynn on, you know, his first kind of major motion picture um, and finding, I mean, you know, you, you've given us a lot of insight into finding these really great moments, but it just feels like such an established piece of work. So Lynn brings 20 years of working in the theater to filmmaking, and he brought something that I think only someone who works in theater could have brought. He brought this idea of workshopping, a show to our movie. So during prep, we didn't need to know all the answers. It was really in a in a in a in a theater in a, when you're workshopping a play, 
you could write it and workshop it and write it and workshop it over and over and over again, like Jonathan did with Superbia for eight years without a public performance. And so, so that's the way we approached our prep. And I haven't approached prep that way where it really was, was Lynn exploring and discovering and he brought the whole team of people. We would usually during storyboard sessions, it's just me and the director and the storyboard artist. But on this, we also had the AD and the production designer and the writer, Stephen Levinson. I've never had access to a writer all through prep this way. And, and we'd read the scene out loud and then we'd start talking about it. Then we'd start drawing it. And then we'd look at it the next day and redraw it. It was this, and so, I think, I think his confidence comes in that he, he is he is open to exploring and trying new things, and also just a sponge for information. He wants to learn everything, and and so so by the time we started shooting, there there was very little questions left. Yeah, and he's such a great kind of pivot to the other film as you know, composer of In the Heights, the other film you've uh, worked on this this season. Um, and you know, going back to that question we were just talking about of the intimacy of Tick Tick Boom, you know, In the Heights has such a different scale. I mean, so many huge ensemble numbers, uh, major choreography, so many different locations. Um, so can you talk about kind of grappling with just the sheer scale of this humongous uh, and beautiful musical. Uh, so In the Heights was epic. I mean, there's 16 or 17 numbers in In the Heights and it's almost all, it's like 75% music, the movie, and it's two and a half hours long. And it is so, and, and we had the exact same shooting schedule on Tick, Tick, Boom that we had on In the Heights. We had 49 days and, um, and Tick, Tick, Boom is, it's so intimate and personal and, um, and it has its own challenges, but In the Heights, the major challenge for us was the amount of days we had and the, I mean, John Chu, dreams so big his dreams are bigger than any human being I've ever met and so when he took those musical numbers and he said okay we're taking 96,000 and putting it in a swimming pool and not just a swimming pool the two biggest swimming pools in New York City that exist in Washington Heights or Pacenti phase we're going to shoot underground in a subway three stories underground and have it be this beautiful elegant ballet with this huge light show and we have one day to do it um so so time was time was our challenge on that and i'm so proud of in the heights because i feel what we accomplished is is and is was so huge and then also telling a personal intimate story too of usnavi and and all the characters all our our cast their dreams and and, and Tick, Tick, Boom and In the Heights, at the core of it, even though they're so vastly different, are about dreamers and, and not giving up on your dreams. And I feel lucky to be able to tell these two stories, to have been able to tell these two stories this year. Yeah, you do get so much of the interiority of character in In the Heights within those kind of humongous and, and uh, epic uh, musical numbers where you're juggling so many different characters and narratives. Um, and 96,000 is a good example of it in that, you know, as you're kind of moving around this pool, you're following so many different characters and storylines. Um, can you just talk about a bit more about the challenges of, I have to imagine that was one of the largest kind of challenges you were all facing down as you were prepping and, and kind of breaking the shoot. What was it like to to kind of grapple with that um, that enormous uh, number, given you know the kind of elements you were dealing with? Ninety six thousand was a uh, we had two days to shoot it. We ended up with a third because of um, we had rain the first two days, so we really had one day to shoot that. And I mean, when when it was pouring rain, we do the underwater shots or <clears throat> or we do shots where people were splashing so you couldn't see the rain on top of the water. So it was, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water. 
it was uh, a huge challenge. And it was very, very early on in our shoot. I think it was at the end of the second week or the beginning of the third and out of nine weeks or 10 weeks. And so, so um, we were also still finding our rhythm and then being having 500 extras, 75 dancers, and our entire cast pretty much, except the Rosarios at the swimming pool, it was crazy. I mean, it was the planning that went into that. And then we had an exact plan where we were gonna be when to make sure we got everything in those two days. And then we had to throw it out because of the weather. So, so but then the next week we had a, another challenge. I mean, each number felt like insurmountable and then we did it and then it was like, yay, we can do it. We can keep going, so. Yeah, another number I wanted to ask you about is um, Blackout uh, that ends, you know, in the play, it ends uh, ends the first act of the play, um, because that that really addresses a different facet of your of your role, because so much of it is about the lighting. Um, you know, the power has gone out and there's candles and cell phones and fireworks and all these different sources of light to kind of guide us through, you know, this first few moments of, of the Blackout that lasts a while. Um, so can you talk about, you know, how you approached lighting that sequence and all the different kind of, again, various locations and characters that you're following over the course of that, that number? Um, so Blackout is, e each sort of location is lit differently. When they first come out of the club, we just use the car headlights. Um, and we had a very light ambient source, but we really basically turned it off and just let the headlights play. And then we get back to our intersection and our intersection, it was, it was about taking away all the light. So we had to, I did lots of night scouts at our intersection because we needed to identify who need, who, what storefronts needed to turn off their lights, what apartment buildings needed to have their lights out. Um, and then we put huge lights on top of every building. And there were two, there's called Sky Panel 360s. And there were two like set up every so often along, for four blocks in, uh, on either, on all North, East, South and West. And one of them created our ambient light. So we had a base level of darkness and the other was our fireworks. And and so, and we probed around them with all these colors and then pops of white light because we realized like that really sold the fireworks. And, and right before in the height shot, I went to Disney World with my family and I have a little girl, she was three then. And when we went and watched the fireworks, I didn't watch the fireworks, I just watched her and I watched the light playing on her face and I filmed it with my phone and I, and, and I just started to study like how do, what, set, what, lighting effects would sell a firework and so we did lots of tests on the fireworks and then we go into abuela's house and and they light they create little lanterns out of their cell phones and little pieces of glass and that came about in an amazing way which was we had to shut all the power out on our street because we were having a lightning storm and the ad department threw me and lynn and john and kiara into abuela's apartment and we were sitting there in the dark and I said, well, John, let's just practice what we would, we would be delight. And so we started taking out our cell phones and then we started looking for little pieces of glass. And Lynn's like, what are you doing? And we're like, we're, we're doing a lighting test for blackout. And we found all the pieces of glass that we ended up using in her cabinets in that apartment because that was a real uh, real location um, right there at our intersection. So it was really cool. Wow. Um, and finally, and, and briefly, um, there's a lovely moment in, in the Heights where Abuela is talking about the little details um, on the embroidery on the napkin. Um, and inspired by that, I just wanted to ask you, what are your may maybe favorite shots or favorite uh, little details in both of the films? Um, I think in in Tick Tick Boom, my one of my favorite details is this close up shot on Andrew's eye, and it starts out of focus and then it comes into focus, and it's when he you first hear the Sondheim music, the PBS music playing, um, and then a detail for In the Heights, um, there's these two women hanging at the very opening of the movie. There's two women just hanging outside of their apartment. And I remember we looked up and we're like, let's film them. And they were real people on the block. And just the fact that like, we used real people throughout in the Heights and peppered them through in and, and, and 
honoring the community that was there. And so those, I think those are my two details quickly. Uh, Alice Brooks, congratulations on both In the Heights and Tick Tick Boom. And thanks so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you so much. 